Okay, welcome to, oops, I gotta get this guy up, sorry. I didn't do that last time. All right. <clears throat> um, another series on, uh, related obliquely to the fear of God, <clears throat> called uh, Loving a Fearsome God. Uh, the four, past four sermons have dealt with various aspects of fearing God and why we should do that. And one of the questions kind of came up about, uh, you know, if God is so awesome and dreadful and, you know, in a good way, uh, fearsome, how are we supposed to kind of love him, be all warm and fuzzy and cuddly with him? So I asked various members of the body for some thoughts about why it is that we're tempted to not fear God. And then how do we actually show that we love God? So I got really great responses. I got a lot of them. So this is going to be a multiple, multiple part series in trying to deal with it, um, answering the question. And some of the insightful comments are just wonderful about how people love uh, God. So one of the questions, uh, after I kind of looked at all this, the scriptures and put together some, some thoughts, um, I usually go online to find out what some other people have thought. And what I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for things that you know, might be helpful for the body. And, and I'm also looking for things that maybe need to be corrected in common evangelical thinking. So this first question actually deals with uh, the latter of things that maybe need to be corrected. Uh, should we love God out of fear or fear God out of love? And the right answer is yes. But if you have to pick one or the other, um, <clears throat> I think that the first part of loving him out of fear comes first. And we're going to take a look at Deuteronomy 6 in a few minutes to uh, elaborate on that concept. I came across an article uh, that was, you know, I think representative of uh, a Jewish perspective. I got a Catholic perspective and I got a Protestant perspective. So we're very ecumenical here. Um, and the Jewish guy, the Modis or whatever, used, uh, was kind of living in a Muslim country and out outwardly was a Muslim, though inwardly he was a Jew. So we even, you know, picked up another religion to take a look at that perspective. <clears throat> and all of them said we're supposed to Fear God out of love. And I looked at the argumentation in all the articles, and they kind of, the argumentation actually provided a perspective that we're supposed to love God out of fear. Um, it was amazing. They, they all quoted Deuteronomy 6, which we'll look at, and they didn't really give scriptural support for their arguments. Other than that, um, I'm thinking that they probably went into uh, 1 John 4, we love him because he first loved us. Actually, the Protestant one kind of came up with that. <clears throat> so I'll deal with uh, th this concept um, of loving, um, fearing God out of love. Because he first loves us, then we're supposed to love him. It doesn't really mention fear does in, in verse 19, but it does in the passage. So 1 John 4 it says, no one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God's love abides, remains, dwells in us. And if we love one another, his love has been perfected in us. This word for perfect is to be brought to completion. So uh, love has an, a, is a purpose for God's love, and it actually reaches its fulfillment as we love one another, because the world can see how we love one another and be drawn to uh, the love that God has for them through us. I think that's how that works. A little later on, he says, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So notice there's a love and then there's a trust um, in God's love. Uh, it could be that Jesus died for your sins here. But I think a lot of people wrestle with the fact that maybe God doesn't love them. And uh, in this Next couple of sermons, I hope to really address that. Uh, God does love us. It's just that we don't always perceive it as love for reasons that we'll see even today. God is love. Uh, one of the characteristics, he's holy, he's just, he's love, he's merciful, he's got a bunch of other good stuff. But love is uh, ranks right up there, particularly in Christendom. <clears throat> and he who abides in love, 
kind of remains in the sphere of love, abides in God, and God is also in him. So we're going to see a little later in John 14, if we love God, he actually comes and dwells in us. Now, uh, by this abiding love, um, oh, this, this verse I gave you in verse 17, I gave you the kind of a Greek um, translation, kind of pretty uh, according to the Greek word order, because it makes a point. So here's the point. I hope I don't lose you on this. So uh, By this, which is the stuff up here, we abide in love. God's love has been perfected in us, all right, which is just basically what it said up here, okay? So he hasn't really changed this idea. And for those of you who know how to look at an interlinear, it has the definite article. By this has been perfected the love, and the is also translated this, you know, like 350 times. Uh, this love is perfected in the midst of us. So as believers abide in God's love, we share that with each other. We do so so that we'll have fearless confidence in the day of judgment. Now, if you're going to look at a lexicon, you'll find one, this is one of the options, and I think this is really reflective of Paul's, not Paul, it's John's thinking. Day of judgment is coming for the whole world. Believers get judged, unbelievers get judged, unbelievers get judged on whether or not they accepted Christ. Believers get judged on how well they have obeyed God loving him and loving others. And we can face that judgment with fearless confidence. We don't have to be squirming worms saying, oh, you know, God, you saved me. That's great. That's all I have to offer. Um, that gets us out of the lake of fire, but it doesn't really get us the approval of God. But if we are like he is in our world, we can have fearless confidence. If we love like Christ loves, if we become Christ-like, if we sacrifice ourselves to do the Father's will and uh, love others, then we'll be like Jesus is. And then we can do well the day of judgment because God's going to look at us. We're going to look like his son. He's really pleased with his son and he'll be really pleased with us. Then here's the verse that was brought up in the Fear of God series. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So, Okay, notice the underlying words. We're dealing about this love that has been perfected. Not necessarily love that is, you know, absolutely perfect, but it's kind of been brought to accomplish its goal. And we have no fear of judgment, we'll have fearless confidence. That's why I like that little translation up here. No need to fear. Um, if we are like Christ, we'll do well. Fear involves or has as a consequence... Another way that is translated right there has as a consequence, punishment. Um, and those who knew the will and didn't do it will kind of get punished uh, more than those who didn't know and didn't do it will still suffer some negative consequences. But the one who fears has not been made perfect in love. And then it goes on to say, we love him because he first loved us. Then I'll go on to say about loving our brothers. So the idea behind this is we don't have anything to fear if we're doing what God wants us to do, chief of which is obey his commands, top two commands, love God and love our neighbor. Before I leave the screen, uh, and we're going to get down to Deuteronomy. So uh, I just kind of looked at the use of love and fear in the law. So I didn't use all the words for love. I didn't use all the words for fear. Um, but love shows up 208 times in the Old Testament, fear 314. Hmm. If you actually break it down to where it's talking about loving God or fearing God, fear of God outnumbers the verses that tell us to love God by a margin. I can't remember exactly what it was. But in the law, you know, the reason I'm doing this is when you get to Deuteronomy 6, okay, that's the key passage that authors quote. Um, I think it's a great starting point. Uh, that's when the nation of Israel uh, came out of Egypt, uh, went through the wilderness, disobeyed God when he told them to go to the promised land. So he made them wander in the desert for 40 years, wiped out that entire generation, all the fighting men above 18 years of age. He then brings the next generation that he cared for for 40 years 
in the wilderness. Shoes didn't wear out, bread came from heaven, water sprung out of rocks, cloud covered them by um, the day, and you know, pillar of fire kept them warm at night. They were under God's care, and then Deuteronomy happens. This is how you're going to enjoy your life in the promised land. And it has a lot of implications for us in the New Testament. So coming into that, love was mentioned 13 times in the book of Genesis. And it was basically love of, you know, Jacob for his wife or um, Jacob for his sons. Zero times does it actually refer to loving God. So that whole preface to the Exodus generation, nothing about loving God. Then in the book of Exodus, Exodus 20 is where you get the Ten Commandments. So uh, you know, it's kind of the highlight of this book, and then he actually dwells with them in the end of the book, chapter 33 or something. It's mentioned once, and one other time it's mentioned if a, a slave loves his master and doesn't want to leave him. So it's twice in the book of Exodus, once is in the giving of the law, which we're commanded to obey, and we're commanded to love God there. It's not a base a motivation for uh, fearing him. It's mentioned twice in Leviticus as loving your neighbor, and it's mentioned zero times in the book of Numbers. So uh, I'm looking at this, you know, first document, the law, uh, the five books that you know, Jews and Christians and Muslims all believe came from God. And I basically have one verse that talks about loving God. So it gives a kind of sense of proportion, a uh, bunch of verses on fearing him. I can count those up. But uh, like uh, one of the first spots fear shows up, it's Genesis 3 when uh, Adam sinned and he feared God. I uh, was afraid of God because of that. So coming into this Deuteronomy 6, uh, I've got a pretty strong case that, including what it actually says in Deuteronomy 6, that we really uh, need to have this fear of this pleasing God before we can actually properly love him. Otherwise, we take him for granted, and we'll see that in the comments down below. So back to uh, 1 John 4, and uh, I just throw this in here because you're going to need it down below when we talk about loving uh, others. Someone says, I love God and hates his brother. He's a liar. Um, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So our love for God basically shows itself up in our love for others. Uh, some people basically just totally miss the first part about loving God and just say, oh, we're just supposed to love people. No, the first command is first we love God, then we love people. And uh, this is the command that we have from him from the beginning. If uh, he who loves God must love his brothers. So we'll come back to that again when it talks about loving God below. Um, yeah, there it is. I'm sorry. So the stuff in the green ink, uh, I'm going to send around this document when I finish uh, slotting people's responses and I got a few a little late. I asked the question, why are we tempted to not love God? And uh, someone responded with uh, elaborating love accurately as loyalty. It's one of the major characteristics Trust, surprisingly, that is a big component of loving someone. If you just think about human relationships, uh, trust in the other person is uh, huge. And then obedience. So those three elements, and there are actually a couple more, but we'll look at them you know, down below in Roman numeral three. Uh, those are how we love God. And we're tempted to not love God for some of these reasons. Uh, someone said, we don't understand nor value the loyalty aspect of love. <clears throat> and a number of years ago when I did a series on loving God and loving others, uh, that was a characteristic that stood out head and shoulders above all others, being loyal to God. And if we understand the ancient Near Eastern context, being loyal to someone is uh, you know, a, a major deal in one's life. Um, when I used to teach my Western Civ course, um, we got uh, talking about relationships at one point and in each, each of the classes. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that people who kind of are raised in a anything goes culture 
would repeatedly get very upset over is when someone would cheat and not be loyal. And uh, I'm thinking, well, you know, what is that in the human nature that makes that such a um, visceral response to, to someone not being loyal? And I think partly we're created that way, partly we get our worth and value from it. But I don't think people do understand the concept of loyalty. Um, you know, they change sports teams, they change political affiliations, they, you know, it's like there's, there's no constancy, uh, whatever mood happens to hit someone, then that's what they um, tend to go with. Uh, this person said, I know I didn't value or understand it, so I had to train myself to do it. And I, I left that comment in because it, it, that's just a great I, idea that Paul instructs Timothy to Timothy or Titus, train himself to be godly, Timothy. Um, we do need to train ourselves. It's not like uh, no. except Christ and whatever happens. It's you actually have to discipline yourself. You have to train. You Paul told the Corinthians, you got to run so as to win. Therefore, you need, Paul said he beat his body, he made it to slave, left after, lest after he preached to others, he'd be a castaway. So if the mighty apostle Paul, who could raise the dead, heal the sick, write scripture, talk face to face with Jesus, said he needed to constantly keep himself in training, then don't you think that would somehow apply to us as well? Someone said, loyalty was a foreign concept to me, practically speaking. Um, I was always on to the next thing. And I didn't realize that my loyalty shifted to whatever was giving me what I wanted at the time. And then their self-evaluation is, that was selfish. So we, we get into something, sometimes even into the service of God, and we think, you know, that we, we just give ourselves to that. And then other things like quiet times, relationship with him, higher priorities, all that stuff kind of goes by the wayside. Because the loyalty shifted from God and doing his will to whatever gives us what we want at the moment. Affirmation, value, worth, a good feeling, extra sleep. Um, we're more loyal to our pillows than we are to God's word. So you should basically use the Bible as your pillow and it'd be good. Um, another response was, we think it's not worth it um, to, be, to love God. Uh, which is really a distorted perspective, but it's it's true. I mean, I sometimes feel that way. Uh, and that arises when we're not getting our needs or desires met. So this, the essence of love, from one perspective, is a meeting of needs. If you love someone, you meet their needs, you serve them. And when someone serves your needs, you feel more positively towards them. But what happens when they don't serve your needs? Then what do you do? Well, you'll find someone else who will. Well, no, no, no. You, you basically need to go back to that concept of loyalty and remain loyal to your agreement with the person, loyal to your responsibilities to that person. Um, loyalty basically supersedes how you feel. Another reason, which is really common, is uh, we doubt his goodness. And you know, that causes people to do all kinds of nasty things and self-destructive behaviors. Um, because they don't think that God's commands are for our benefit. They think God is holding something back from us. Uh, you know, Psalm 84, 11 says, No good thing does he withhold from them who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold. So God will give me what is good if I walk uprightly. And this God's not good is Satan's oldest lie. Uh, that's how he tripped up Eve and we got into the mess we got into. You should say Adam and Eve. Um, some corollary to that is he's not doing what we want him to do. So we'll show him. We won't love him. We won't worship him. We won't give him what he wants. And uh, <clears throat> I remember in the early years of Big Apple Chapel, there, there were so many people who kind of felt they're perfectly legitimate to, uh, if God doesn't give me what I want, then I'm not going to give him what he wants. And eventually we had to try to move people to a more biblical perspective. Some got there and some didn't. And we're going to look at this word here a lot, and you'll see it in the passage. Uh, we are tempted to not love God because we're not displaying hesed, which is covenantal loyalty. Actually, the Hebrew way of pronouncing this, <laughs> hesed, you got to put the in there, like Ahmed. Um, 
And this is an essential characteristic of God. When Moses asked God to show him his glory, God proclaims his hesed and his loyalty, and that's his glory, and that's the essential characteristic of God. So we're, we're going to get there in Exodus at the end of uh, Roman number one. So when we're not being loyal to God, we tend not to be loyal to him, or we tend not to expect ourselves to be worthy of him being loyal to us. Let me try that again. So when we are not being loyal to him, we don't consider ourselves worthy of his love. And then we don't love him, and it's just this downward spiral. So those are some of the reasons, I think i got more on the next page, that we are tempted to not love God, which hopefully the scriptures will fix. Oh, yeah. Okay. Here's some more. i got some really good answers here. He's not fulfilling his part of the bargain. For example, he's not helping us. So we have to do more work, and we don't have the time to give him any time. So later we're going to see that... Um, Giving God time uh, is just like a normal interpersonal relationship. Time is a useful way of furthering the relationship. If you have no time for the person, you usually don't have a relationship with them. And um, I just threw in here a little reminder that um, one of the ways we interact with God, according to the scriptures, is we offer him sacrifices. Uh, sacrifice of praise, doing good and sharing. This is the book of Hebrews. Sacrifices God is well pleased. In the Old Testament, you had to kill a good animal. Sometimes burn it up completely. We don't have to do that, fortunately. So we don't have to be farmers. Another reason why we are not uh, showing love and loyalty to God is we're confused by his actions. Um, so you know, we kind of expect God to act a certain way, and if he doesn't, then we kind of short circuit to some extent and we're really not trusting him. Um, like even if I can't figure it out, I need to continue to trust God. Even if I don't see how it will work, I need to continue to trust God. Even if I see there's no way that it will work in this life, I need to continue to trust God. Uh, from what I understand, trust is also an important part of the scriptures and a biblical lifestyle. So in an elaboration of that, someone wrote, Ultimately, God has already done the clarifying of confusion by revealing his character, which is actually one of the points down below, through his word and for Job, you know, some other way. So poor Job, you know, it's like he's doing all the stuff he thinks he's supposed to be doing. God is totally pleased with him. God, Job is not sinning. And um, his life just comes crashing down on him. So... You can imagine Job scratching his head saying, what's going on here? Why, why, why is this? And ultimately, he had to trust that God was sovereign. That means he can do whatever he wants and is in control and can do what he wants and will do what he wants. But he's also holy and good, so we can trust him. And Job has this great, great line. Even if he kills me, he slays me, it's the translation they memorized it in, I will trust him. And then Job also expressed the confidence, and I know that I will stand on the earth at the last day, that God would resurrect him, and uh, Job would be in a good position. Well, fortunately for Job and for us who uh, live in this world, God actually intervened before Job died um, <clears throat> and uh, blessed him at the end. So his character, it's, uh, and not being confused, it's just a matter of us seeking out and reminding ourselves of the answers. Yeah, if, if we want answers from God, they're there. Uh, it may not be as detailed of, as an answer that we want, um, but that's where faith comes in. Uh, we trust that God is good, even though we can't see how it's going to work out. So even if we get an answer that isn't what we want, it's enough for us to rest in God's perfect plans. And I think I added trials included. So when we get trials, it's like, ah, God's off the throne. He forgot me. He doesn't care about me. And lastly, under this section, uh, we're not grateful. Uh, we focus on the negatives and we forget the many benefits towards us. And you continually see this in the Psalms. Um, you see it when the nation of Israel is in great distress and they're calling out to God. They go back to the fact that he saved them. The psalmist goes back to the fact that God knit him together in his mother's womb. God has plans for us. 
He didn't put us on the earth by accident. He has put us here and he maintains us here for a purpose. And part of that purpose is going to be to be loyal to him to the bitter end, even if it's bitter. Question I think it's worth asking ourselves is where would we be without a relationship with God? Think about it. Before you found out about Christ and his love for you and God's plan for you, where were you? Um, you know, I was basically had no meaning, no purpose, nothing. Uh, Ephesians 2 kind of describes it. Uh, Ephesians 2, Paul talks about the fact that before Christ came into their lives, they were destined for wrath. They had no future, no hope. They didn't have a purpose. They didn't have peace. They didn't have fellowship. And one that I added that wasn't necessarily in Ephesians 2, they didn't have his presence. Um, now we have all those things in our relationship with God through Christ. Uh, we don't have to face wrath. We have a future and a hope. Even in Jeremiah, it says, you know, God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. In the book of Ephesians, it says God has this great inheritance in store for those who are loyal to him in his future kingdom. Um, one of the things that really turned my crank is I now had a purpose for living. I remember the dean of the engineering school calling me in and after talking with me for a while, suggested, it's my soft, freshman or soft, freshman year, sophomore year, yeah, it was hazy days. Um, basically suggested I become a race car driver. And I said, why? Because I had a friend who was an automotive engineer and I think he's suggesting I go into that. And he said, because you don't care if you live or die. And I said, ah, you got that right, bro. Anyway, um, I found the purpose when I found Christ, so uh, I value that immensely. Which leads us to our first Roman numeral. And you'll see this point reflected in the comments that uh, others made up above. Knowing the person, the character of God, and knowing his past, present, and future acts, as well as promises, that leads us to fear him, trust him, and love him. Now, I don't pick up the fear one in a way that's going to be that applicable to people. So I'll mention it now in case I forget. If you ask people, why did you get saved? Why did you ask Jesus to be your sin bearer and payment for your sin? Ultimately, it was because you heard there were negative consequences for going on your merry way, ignoring God during your days here on earth. In other words, there was a consequence for your sin. Um, modern evangelicalism has kind of taken away this whole aspect of sin. It's like, you know, people don't want to talk about that. And we don't want people to think we're kind of, you know, old timey. But even if you take the one about, uh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life and he wants a relationship with you. Uh, the fear of not having that relationship or losing that opportunity also drives people to say, I want Jesus as my savior and I want all these benefits that God has in store. So uh, we'll see the trust and love down below. So Deuteronomy 6 is what's known as the great Shema uh, in the Jewish uh, worship. Uh, Shema means here, and they have the great Shema, the great here. And this is right after the nation of Israel has been given uh, a reboot of the Ten Commandments. So two places we find the Ten Commandments in Scripture, Exodus 20, and then 40 years later, actually a little more than 40 years, you have them redone in Exodus 5. And there's a little preamble, which I'm going to skip because I'm running out of time, in uh, chapter 4. So Moses uh, was told by God uh, in, earlier in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses, you know, because you struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock, you disobeyed. And uh, both Moses in, oh, maybe it's chapter 4 or 5, Deuteronomy, and uh, one, the psalmist somewhere in the eh, maybe 70s or 100s, early 100s, somewhere in there, 
basically blames the people. It's because of the people and their constant grumbling just got on Moses' nerves, for lack of a better word. And he blew it. And then God said, do not go into the promised land. You are going to die. And Moses begs him. And this is the Moses who basically stood between God and the annihilation of the nation of Israel. And God obviously loved Moses and had a great plan for him, and he's got great plans for him in the future. But there was a consequence for his sin, which kind of, you know, boy, if that's going to happen to Moses, we should probably pay attention to us because God doesn't play favorites. He's totally just. So anyway, Moses not getting to the promised land is something that has always uh, caused me um, consternation or disconsternation. That's one of those things. Anyway, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and the judgments, which, oops, it's really Yahweh. So in your Bible, wherever you have the capital L-O-R-D, that is the translation, or the, or the translators put in uh, Yahweh. This is the covenantal name of God. This is the name of not the guy upstairs, uh, not the name of the higher power. This is the name of the God who spoke on Mount Sinai, who basically kicks off Western Civ, uh, which we are currently enjoying today as it demises and deteriorates and gets destroyed. But anyway, um, Yahweh, whenever you seek L-O-R-D, it's the name of God as he revealed himself to the Jewish people. Personal God, not some impersonal force. Now, Yahweh, your God, Moses says, has commanded Moses to teach these commandments to the people that you may observe them in the land which you're crossing over to possess. He has commanded them to be taught that you may fear the Lord your God and keep all which I have commanded you all the days of your life. And here's the point of that, that your days may be prolonged. They may have a long, prosperous life. Right? It's not so you can just be miserable. It's like this is what you need to do to enjoy the land. Therefore, Shema, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it. I, I love careful to observe. You have to be really careful to pay attention. Not just pay attention, but be careful to pay attention. And this concept shows up, we talked about under fear of God. Uh, someone just mentioned there in Joshua, Joshua 1, verse 8, meditate in the law that you may be careful to obey. Observe all that it says. Why? That it may go well with you. So God gives us these commands for our benefit that it may go well with you. So here, O Israel, the Lord your God, Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. And I don't want to get into too much. The, the idea behind this is that he is, is, only, is the, the one, the true God, the only God. There's no one to countermand his orders. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God. Okay? Um, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This gets repeated in the New Testament. So back here, um, we have to, we've got the commands so we may fear him, and then the order is to love him, and then we're going to get fear again. So the love is bracketed by fear. If you love him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, there's not a whole lot of room for anything else. What about me? Well, that's how you get the good stuff about you. And you shall be in your heart. That means that's a spot where you make your decisions, your heart. Um, basically, you need to learn to put hide God's word in your heart. So when you need to make a decision, your value system says, do it God's way. And then you should teach them diligently um, to your kids and grandkids. Then beware, lest you forget, Lord, once you get prosperity, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Everyone, before they get transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, which is where all true believers are, has been in bondage to Satan. They're walking according to the pattern of this world, which is Satan's world. They're walking according to the influence of the prince of darkness, who is the ruler of this world. They are in bondage, and they don't even know it. You know, you know, eventually, it becomes clear, but most people think, I'm not in bondage. But uh, Jesus said in John 8, you know, 
you continue to those who believed in him, if you continue in his word, you are his disciples indeed, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And they said, we're, we're not, you know, we don't need to be set free, we're, we're doing fine. And that's how most people think. Um, you know, they don't know any better. Uh, once you learn the scriptures, you realize, wow, there's something better that God has in store for people. So you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and take oaths in his name, which means, you know, he's the one who you're accountable to. Don't go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. For the Lord your God is jealous. Oh, come on, God, be more open-minded. I mean, you know, come on. Um, no, he's a jealous God. And the anger of the Lord your God will be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth if you go serve other gods. Now, that seems to be that fear is a motive that keeps you loyal to him and loving him. Don't tempt the Lord your God. Diligently keep his commands. And this is just like Jesus said, John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Like, real clear, it hasn't changed. Uh, so, you shall diligently keep the man's commands and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Whoa, that sounds familiar, Bill. Didn't you have some kind of definition for righteousness and fear of the Lord? Yeah, it might have been where I stole it. Um, being careful to do what's right in his sight. Doing what's right in his sight is righteousness. Being careful to do what's right in his sight is fear of the Lord. And you do that so it will be well with you. All right, so it goes well. And the Lord your God, or the Lord, commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear always for our good. Right? So we're going to fear him, that he may preserve us alive this day. And this will be righteousness for us if we're careful to observe all these commands before the Lord your God as he has commanded. You can't go through Deuteronomy or actually Exodus, um, yeah, it's even some in Leviticus, without seeing the stuff again and again. You do what God commands so it will go well for, with you. Therefore, your benefit and you do all that he says, not just whatever you want to. Uh, someone in the body said, you have to place God as your object of loyalty. And you do that cognitively via the will. So you have to actually kind of make a decision. God, you are my God and I will serve you. And you don't let go or shift or change. And summary, it's a lordship decision. We call him Lord. And Jesus said in his first sermon, why, why, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? I mean, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Um, so he's the one that we're loyal to. He's the one that we serve first. And uh, anything else is according to his priority list, but below loving him, including loving others. Uh, this person actually accurately said, I think we're loyal to all kinds of other things, like how we feel. <laughs> yes, my feelings are the ruler of my life. Well, that's kind of not good because feelings change. They go up and down. And if you have, you know, your feelings ruling your life, you do really, you sin. It's simple as that. Um, we're loyal to our ideal job title, our affirmation, our comfort, you know, desires. We split our loyalty and try to make that work. Okay, I'll be loyal to God for five minutes in the morning. And then for the rest of the day, I'll do whatever I want. Um, it might make you feel good about, oh, I'm, I'm being a good person. I spent time with God. Or I even you know, went to church or listened to a sermon on Sunday. So, yeah, I'm doing really well. And now the rest of my life is mine. And I've just observed over the decades, anybody who has that perspective winds up poorly. Um, just like the scriptures say, we are to be wholehearted, to love, serve, and follow God. Wholeheartedness links with loyalty as the object of what you choose to be loyal to, uh, which is to love and serve. And we need to be loyal to all the commands, not just the ones we prefer. And to all that I say, amen. We need to get down to Exodus. Ah, here we are. Okay. <clears throat> so this is probably as far as we'll get today. But this is the passage um, where... It's, I think, after the golden calf incident and um, Israel rebelling against God and rebelling against Moses. And you know, Moses is just uh, kind of worn down by their constant uh, rebellion. And he asked God in chapter 33 to show Moses Yahweh's glory. Now, <clears throat> 
Moses had come down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments inscribed on two tablets. And when he saw the nation of Israel, <laughs> I love this phrase, a whoring after other gods, um, he threw down the tablets and broke them, symbolizing the fact that Israel had just broken the law. First law being no other gods before him. So, uh, you know, I guess he kind of was getting burned out and he asked God to kind of refresh him. And God says, okay, Mo, go get two more tablets, you them out. So Moses had to go and carve out two tablets all night and be ready in the morning. So early in the morning, you can go read this and fill in the spots I left out. Moses rose early with the two tablets of stone. <clears throat> Here's a little verse to encourage you to be ready in the morning to meet with God as Moses was. If you want to see God's glory, you have to wake up earlier than the word, the birds. You know, it's like you, you could do it a little later, but you know, it has to be a priority. So Moses rose early. Um, Abraham, when he was told to sacrifice his son, rose early to go do it. Now, if we're really quick to obey, we put that as a priority. Um, God will bless it. I used to be a night owl. I used to have, you know, I didn't do mornings. I didn't go to labs or do anything until noon. It's probably why I had trouble in school. Um, or at least have trouble staying in school. <clears throat> but as I you know, started following God, I wound up getting up earlier and earlier, and I you know, actually am almost cognizant, you know, a cup of coffee sure helps in the morning to be able to meet with God. So there Moses is, he's got his tablets, he woke up early, he climbed the mountain, and then Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there with him, and he met with God. God was with him because he followed what God said. So, you know, put a little thought in there. And then God proclaimed the name of the Lord. So the Hebrews don't want to take, or the Jewish people don't want to take God's name in vain. So instead of saying Yahweh, they call, say Lashem, which means the name. But here he is actually proclaiming his name, and it's Yahweh, Yahweh God. Now, let's see, what, this is God's self-disclosure. This is what Nehemiah appeals to after the Babylonian captivity, and he's rebuilding uh, the, the wall and the people. Uh, lots of other times in the scriptures you'll see this passage uh, used as people are addressing God to remind themselves, like, you don't know, need to remind God of who he is. I think he knows pretty well. He's got a name tag. I am Yahweh. Hello. Um, but he to remind ourselves of who God is. So God is giving this disclosure to Moses to encourage him, and I always find it encouraging. So, I'm Yahweh. I am merciful and gracious. Wow. Okay. Now, he, he didn't wipe out the nation. He thought of it, but Moses kind of talked them out of it. And he's long-suffering. And I think at that point, the evangelical community has their Bible's end. He's merciful and gracious and long-suffering. He's going to forgive us regardless of what I do. There are no consequences. Isn't it great that he paid the penalty for all my sins, so now I can go live as I want? No, that's not what it's about. He also is abounding, and this is the thing that gets noticed. There's abounding. Is there abounding before merciful? No. Abounding before gracious? No. Abounding before long-suffering? No. Hmm, okay, so... The thing that he's really emphasizing, which he actually repeats down here, is the chesed, the covenantal loyalty and faithfulness. Uh, sometimes says loving kindness and truth. Um, truth is a other possible de definition, but faithfulness normally is God is loyal to his covenant and faithful to do everything that he promised. And then the word, he keeps chesed, he guards chesed. This is not just saying, you know, it's just... For thousands, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And this is another spot where most Bibles end, because they forget this next part. He by no means clears the guilty. He punishes the guilty in you know, multiple generations. There's a consequence for people's actions. So Moses made haste, bowed his head to the earth, and worshipped. And then he said, uh, Yahweh, Lord, if I found favor and grace in your sight, and you did say you were kind of gracious. So um, I pray that you would go among us, 
So God basically said he wasn't going to go with him into the promised land. He was just going to send his angel. And Moses you know, basically trusted God more than he trusted God's angel. Although I think angels are pretty trustworthy. And he said, please go with us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, stubborn. And pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Inheritance means a treasured possession. So God agrees and goes with them into the promised land. Before I pause for some questions, let's just take a look at these guys. We are tempted to not love, trust, and obey God because our expectation of what is good is not aligned with God's plan or provision. And this attempting to withhold our love and affection from God manifests itself when things don't turn out the way we envisioned, which we thought would be good. And when we're disappointed or don't feel good. So if we don't feel good, we don't you know, think kindly of God. When do we feel good? Because we didn't get what we want. So we have our little temper tantrum and uh, we think that God is uh, you know, affected by that. Um, if you think about how many believers have temper tantrums when things don't go their way, I think that God has developed a pretty thick skin about that um, throughout history. Uh, someone flipped the question around, when am I tempted to not love God? When I am tempted to not love God? I mean, I obey. 14, 15, if you have my commandments, obey him. I mean, if you love me, obey me. And these are pretty good. When I don't consider his perspective. When it seems like he's withholding something. When he seems distant. Bumper sticker on this. If God seems far away, guess who moved? Uh, it's not God, because he's omnipresent. Uh, you've kind of just turned your back to him. Uh, when I think that his standard is unattainable. Um, that's like, you know, Super Bowl football player saying to the coach, you know, coach, I, I think this thing about, you know, hitting every uh, blocker, I mean, every tackler coming in and blocking him out is just not attainable. It's like, I don't think that's right. Um, no, the, the coach is probably right. And God is always right. Uh, he has a spirit within us to cause us to will and to do his good pleasure. So if he has a standard for us, uh, he gives us all the grace and power to do it. When I don't want to do what he's asking because I think it won't be worth it. Yeah, we, we get short-sighted. Satan blinds us to it. We can't see the whole benefits of obeying God. So I totally understand that one. Um, and then the person reflected on what wrote and said, it looks like lies are the source of the temptation to not owe God via obedience. And I would totally agree that we are usually believing Satan's lies, just like he told Eve, oh, God's withholding something good from you. Um, someone put it this way, when he does not meet my expectations, that leads to me doubting his ability and his goodness, and I get upset at him. I think it points for honesty. It's okay to be honest with God, but let's think about this. Um, like, if God doesn't give us what's good because it wouldn't be good for us, we should be grateful. I have lived long enough to be thankful for God not answering some prayers. Things that I thought were good and God knew better. And I am so grateful that I trusted him and did not pursue the thing that I wanted, but I waited for him to provide what was best. Um, <clears throat> oops, sorry. Okay, I'm tempted to not obey when... I'm prideful and rebellious. Yeah, well, that's part of being human. Uh, we need to kind of become humble and submissive when I think I know better than him. Um, I think it's supposed to be no better than he. Yeah. Anyway, nominative case, not objective there. So I, I like this one because it's, it's so common and comical when you think about um, he is the all-wise God who formed everything, holds it together, knows the future. He knows everything. And I, th he made me for a purpose, and I think I know better. That's like such hubris. That's what Satan's problem was. Um, and, you know, lots of people think they know better than God. And they, you know, basically will discredit his word because, you know, obviously his word disagrees with what I want to do. When he takes away things from me, and loss of anything I think is important to me, um, our attitude here needs to be like Job, the Lord gives, 
the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When we always have all we need to do is will. When I encounter lots of obstacles and sufferings, and he does not seem to care and not do anything about it. All right, so I can totally understand this one um, until you realize that obstacles are opportunities, stole that from Robert Schuller, to trust God. I don't think he had that piece in there. But they're, they're opportunities to draw in God's strength. They're opportunities to draw closer to him. Um, it becomes essentially a joy to suffer with Christ, um, not just because of what we get in the future. Remember Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, count it all joy. Said, uh, Blessed are you when men re uh, revile and persecute and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For James says, count all joy when you count of various trials, knowing that they produce good stuff in you. So God is, when we have the perspective that God allows stuff into our life for our benefit, there's a whole section down below, we're going to talk about how God purifies our faith. And in order for him to purify our faith, not our life, he does that too, but our faith, it's like if every time you believe you got something, your, your faith would be not very strong. But when you believe God, when you don't see it, you've entered into the path of Abraham. Like Abraham believed that God would fulfill his promise to bless him with descendants. Abraham was impotent. His wife was sterile. Uh, he's sterile. I forget how it works. Anyway, uh, it was like, and it went on for years. Um, and God was basically glorifying himself by Abraham's faith. Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He showed that God was worthy of being trusted, even if you don't get the thing that you want. And God's got something better planned for us, says the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 35. And of course God cares for us. He's our shepherd. He knows what we are going through. He sustains us. You know, it's like we're, we're, we're so dissing his reputation by saying, oh, he doesn't care. Now, I will acknowledge that as I've seen people struggle with their jobs and various issues in their lives, and I've been praying for them for years and God doesn't provide. Um, I don't understand why he's doing what he's doing, but I know that they can trust him. And what happens over the decades is you see God eventually does give what's best when it's best. So if you're one of those people who's waiting for God to answer your prayers, I'll put in that category too, um, then you can basically draw comfort from his person and presence, from his character to know that, hey, God knows what he's doing. He didn't, you know, bring us this far to just toss us in the trash heap and make us, you know, grieve for the rest of our days. He's got a plan, and it's that plan is ultimately to bless us. And that gets us through number one. Yippee! Okay, any questions? Okay, you broke up a bit, but I basically got the question, what do we do, or what, what's going on when a person says it's not worth it? That is a matter of perspective and values. Um, normally what happens is we take a look at something and we see it and we desire it and we want it. And this is what James talks about, how lust, uh, when we dwell on it, embrace it, uh, you know, we're, we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. And then when we grab onto it, lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings forth to death. By focusing on that thing that we want and seeking it more than we seek God, it becomes larger to God in our life. And we start basically saying, oh, I have to have this. I need to have this. You know, th th this is essential for my well-being and my mental health. I I've got to have it. And it, as a matter of perspective, it becomes so large that it actually clot crowds out God from our field of vision. So if you take the thing and put it in front of your face, and that's all you see, you don't see God, who is so much bigger than the thing. So you've actually put an idol in the place of God. So that's a matter of perspective. In terms of um, values, it's, you know, before we start glomming down on something and saying, oh, this is what we have to have, we um, need to consider what is God's will for the issue? And, you know, we think, I have to have this job. I have to have this promotion. I have to have this person. I have to have this. I have to have that. Um, 
it's like what what's going to happen in the future if it's all going to burn you know the, the company could go under um you know things can burn down uh people can expire you know the, the it's just like we the thing that's going to last forever is god's word uh, that's enduring forever fear of god endures forever our eternal reward endures forever um people endure forever but you know their state doesn't so it's a an apt comparison so it's really a value thing it's not worth serving god so there's a great passage of scripture that addresses this and it's at the very end of the old testament it's the book of malachi and god is basically the old testament ends with god basically calling out his people on their sins and like he says i've loved you and they say how have you loved us and you know god kind of shows how he really loves them i think i have that down it might have been one of the previous sermons and then the other one says and there's another thing you say it's not worth it to serve me. And, and that really annoys God. So if you have a proper fear of God, you won't say that. Uh, you're basically calling Jesus a liar when he gives this, this first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, oh, it's not worth it to do what you say, Lord, because like, um, I don't get what I want. Well, that event goes back to the value system. You value the wrong things. You value what Satan's values rather than what God values. And when I put it like that, just, just like that, doesn't that become incredibly obvious that what God's va values has eternal value and what Satan values is eternally valueless? So because we are in the world and we haven't kind of been transformed by the renewing of our mind and sanctified ourselves and you know cleaned up our thinking and transformed or metamorphosized by his word, we value the worldly things and anything that's in this world is ultimately valueless it's just a means of getting you eternal value <clears throat> so you know in one sense we're like the wicked and evil servant we, we take the thing we that's in this world that we've even been given by god and say oh i'm going to hold on this uh, and you know, god said no i told you to use that so i can get a return on it use that for my glory and all the stuff that god has given us is to be used for his glory because first corinthians 10 and eh, maybe 31 whatever you do do it all for the glory of god whatever that means all the stuff we do somehow has to get tied into this is going to glorify god this is going to make him look good in the eyes of others this is even going to make him look good when the earth ends and it's final judgment day and the only people that are going to really see it and appreciate it are the demons who realize oh i should have obeyed so perspective values that's kind of what's going on when people say it's not worth it it's so short-sighted it's also a direct affront to god who said you know seek the things above set your affections on things above well, paul said it but holy spirit said it through him Colossians three so you really need to have the scriptures brainwash you, clean out the dirt with the scriptures and value the right stuff. And then it'll go well with you. And then those things no longer have a hold on you. But when we focus on those things that we think we have to have, they put us in bondage. And God's thing is to deliver us from bondage. Okay, another one. Okay, in Psalm 119, um, it's a very good question, and I'm not going to be able to do justice to the answer, but I'll point you in a direction. Psalm 119, 9, 10, and 11. Um, it says, oh, I got it in King James, so it's going to sound a little weird, but you know, how can a person, young man, cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? Then 10 normally gets left out because topical memory system drops it out it says with my whole heart i have sought you don't let me wonder for from your commandments and then verse 11 says thy word i have hidden in my decision making spot my heart so i don't sin against you so part of that is we need to have the word and truth of god replace the lies of satan in our lives 
And we have to get that word and what God says is good into our, you know, value decision-making conscience area so that our decisions are made according to God's will. The more scripture we have in our minds and in our heart, the more we will eventually reflect in our life. So the battle is basically occurs in our mind, uh, lies of Satan versus truth of God. And if we have, if we're regularly spending time in God's word, uh, that's why I really love uh, David Chusse in the NIV UK. It's uh, free on the uh, EU version, I think it is. And I'll just, you know, whenever I, I'm not doing something that I have to actually think about, I will usually have that playing in the background or, you know, put my earplugs in and listen to it. And there's like the more scripture that I have as intake, the more God can use it to guide and direct my behavior. Uh, you'll frequently hear in the praise times people talking about how kind of the Holy Spirit tapped them on the shoulder and brought a verse to mind. And that's, you know, God does that. If you have the verse, then you can bring it to mind. If you don't have it locked away in your thinking, uh, you can do it looking at the pages, but, you know, it takes longer and uh, he normally has less to work with. So, uh, this, the more time you spend in the, God's word, the more you can have that um, give you God's perspective on life. I know it's not a great answer, but we're running short on time and uh, we'll cover it more. There's actually more that comes that will relate to it. Okay, last question. I missed that. Was there one or no? We're done? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you want what's best for us. Thank you that you proved your love to us again and again um, in your uh, salvation of us and in your giving us our daily bread. Uh, thank you for the lives that we lead, for all that you've done in moving us out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of light. Uh, thank you that you've broken the bonds of Satan that keep us shackled to sin and you give us the opportunity to run freely away from them. Um, I pray, Lord, that we would be a people who uh, are loyal to you, are wholehearted in our seeking of you, who seek you according to your word, um, who are sensitive to your spirit, and who bring you glory, uh, which is why you created us. We commit ourselves to that task. In Christ's name, amen.